Well, did you get to the stores last week before everyone else did? Because of the recent panic over the coronavirus, it seems like people all over the world have been going to the stores and stocking up on essentials and emptying the shelves as if it was the end of the world. Recently in Hong Kong, armed robbers stole 600 rolls of toilet paper at gunpoint. Is it just me, or does the world seem to be getting a little crazier than usual? Well, this week in our study through the Gospel of Mark, we are in chapter 13. And in this chapter, Jesus makes some predictions about the end of the world. Now, I planned out this entire series on the book of Mark back in August. So I don't think it's a coincidence that this chapter landed on this Sunday. God might be trying to tell us something here. But I don't think he's telling us that we need to go to the stores and empty the shelves. If anything, God is telling us that we need to spend more time in his word listening to what he's saying than listening to the fear-mongering news media and going into a panic. Mark 13 is without a doubt the most difficult chapter in the book of Mark. And uh, there's a lot of figurative language, a lot of uh, symbols and prophetic language that is hard to interpret. So as we go through this chapter today, uh, you might want to buckle your seatbelts because this is going to be a wild ride. Actually, most of this chapter is dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And we can see that from the very first verse of chapter 13. It says, as he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Jesus and the disciples were leaving the temple for the day. Jesus had been teaching in the temple all day. And remember, this is the final week in the life of Jesus. This is the Passover week. On Sunday, he rode into the temple on the donkey and people sang his praises, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. On Monday, he cleansed the temple, chased out all the money changers and those selling animals in the temple courts. And then on Tuesday, he taught in the temple, and and he answered all those challenging questions that the religious leaders threw at him, trying to trip him up and trap him. And now, he and the disciples are leaving the temple, going out the east side of the city of Jerusalem, down to the Kidron Valley, and up the Mount of Olives on the east side of Jerusalem. And as they do, they're looking at these magnificent buildings and these massive stones. Uh, This photo, by the way, is a 150th model of the Temple of Jerusalem and and all the city, really. It's actually at a museum in Israel, in Jerusalem. And you see this large edifice here. This is huge. I mean, it's about 35 acres and Herod, King Herod the Great, built this, and it, it was a building project that extended far beyond his lifetime. It started about 19 B.C. and didn't end until about 60 A.D. So it's still in the process of being constructed as Jesus and the disciples are walking through this, this area and talking about it. And they're impressed with these massive stones Uh, The majority of the stones uh, weigh between two and five tons each. The largest cut stone there at the Temple Mount weighs over 500 tons. Stephanie and I got to see it in 2006 when we went to Israel. It's part of the lower foundation under the Western Wall, and it measures 40 feet long, 12 feet high, and 14 feet deep. That's larger than the school bus I drive. And it was cut and moved into place. They don't know how, but that's one of the stones there at the foundation of the Western Wall. 
And there was a large wall all around the temple gates uh, with 10 temple gates. Each gate had two doors, 45 feet high and 22 feet wide. Massive gates. And, and this, was, uh, this was impressive. This was amazing. It would be hard to walk through that temple complex and not make a comment about how amazing it was. However, we need to put our, ourselves into the sandals of these disciples and think what they were thinking and feel what they were feeling as they made these comments about the temple. You see, they knew that Jesus is the Messiah. They saw his miracles. Three of them were there on the Mount of Transfiguration when he was glorified before them. And Elijah and Moses were there. So they knew this is the Messiah. He is the king. But they didn't have an accurate understanding of the kingdom Jesus was about to establish. They were still thinking this was going to be a physical kingdom. The, the nation of Israel, independent from the Roman Empire. And, and they were looking at these physical buildings and stones, not just admiring the architecture. See, they believed that Jesus would be establishing his physical throne in Jerusalem and that they were being trained for the top levels of leadership in this new kingdom. They thought they would be on 12 physical thrones ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel. So when they looked at all these buildings... They were thinking, this is going to be ours. We're going to be in charge of all of this. Jesus, look at how amazing these buildings are. Look how huge these stones are. This is all going to be ours. But the kingdom of God is not about physical buildings and massive stones. It's about spiritual stones and a spiritual building. It's about the church, the kingdom of God. So look at what Jesus says in response to their comments. He says in verses 2 through 4, Do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. I would have loved to be there to see the look on the disciples' faces. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, uh, Jesus, uh, tell us when all these things will happen and what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? See, when Jesus said, the, the, the temple, it's all going to be destroyed, that blew their minds. They had to take all of their prophecy charts and throw them out and start over. I mean, they heard Jesus talk about the coming kingdom, and they heard Jesus talk about the end of the age, and, and they heard Jesus talk about uh, the judgment day, but now he's throwing a monkey wrench into their prophecy charts with this destruction of Jerusalem thing. Where does the, they didn't know how any of these fit together. And so the disciples probably get together and say, hey, James, John, Peter... Andrew, go talk to him. Try to get some more information about this. And so they do. They, they say, Jesus, you need to explain this to us. We need a chart. When, when is all this stuff going to happen? In his answer, Jesus tells them some specific things about the destruction of Jerusalem and some general things about the end of the age. The tricky part for us is trying to figure out when he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, and when he's talking about the end of the age. It's not always clear as we go through this chapter. And, and this is called the Olivet Discourse. It's recorded in Matthew 24, in Mark 13, and also in Luke 21. Okay? But all the commentaries, you look at any commentary, you're probably going to find a different view in each one. And it could be that in some of these places, he's talking about both as a dual fulfillment prophecy. And so this is, this is not an easy passage. Uh, this is a difficult passage. And, and remember that this is a sermon that I'm preaching, not a lesson that I'm teaching. 
Okay, so I, I'm not going to go through verse by verse like I would in a Bible college course. Uh, if you want that, come Wednesday night to our life group where we teach this passage. Matter of fact, in your bulletins, there is a set of notes, uh, discussion questions that we go over in our life groups. And if you can't come on Wednesday night, take this home, start your own life group. Get together with family members or friends or neighbors or people at work or, or just as your own personal devotions. Go through this as your own study. Uh, but today, in this sermon, I'm going to focus on four basic principles we find here in Mark 13 that will help us to be prepared, to be ready for the end of the age. How can we be ready for the end of the age? Well, first point, we need to keep the plain things the main things. Okay, keep the plain things the main things. And this is a basic rule of interpretation of Scripture in all of our Bible studies. The plain things are the main things. We, we talked last week about the two greatest commandments, love God and love others. And we saw how, how the Pharisees, they were so focused on all the nitty-gritty details of what each commandment in the law of Moses meant and how to obey each of those commandments in all these different situations of life. And they were so engrossed and obsessed with all those details that they missed the main point. They missed the plain things, the two greatest commandments, love God and love others. If they would have just focused on those, the other commandments would have made sense. Jesus said, these two commandments, upon these two commandments, all the law and the prophets hang. And this principle, keeping the plain things the main things, is especially important when we come to prophecy, Bible prophecy. We need to keep the plain things the main things. God has not given us Bible prophecy to confuse us. Okay? The Bible's not written for confusion, it's written for clarity. And, and the Bible is not meant to be... Uh, a book of theoretical speculation. It's meant to be a book of practical application. So when we come to a prophecy that seems ambiguous and confusing and complicated, it's probably written that way for a reason. It could very well be that God doesn't want us to figure out the prophecy until it's fulfilled. We see that many times in Old Testament prophecy that the Jews did not understand what that prophecy meant until it was fulfilled. And that's, it's, that's probably true with some of the prophecies in the New Testament. There are probably many things that God predicts in ambiguous, dark sayings and figurative language that he doesn't want us to figure out until it's fulfilled. But it's so easy for people to get caught up in the complicated human interpretations and theories about end-time prophecies. And as a result, they completely miss the main purpose of the prophecies. They're so focused on the when of prophecy that they miss the why of prophecy. Look at what Jesus says about the end of the world in Mark 13, 32, the, near the end of this chapter. He says, no one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Jesus told his disciples some specific details about the destruction of Jerusalem. But when it comes to the end of the age, he says, yeah, this is not for you. Okay, you, you are going to be kept in the dark on this one. You don't know the timing of this one. I'm so glad all Christian leaders today have read this verse. And they refrain from making any embarrassing predictions about the return of Christ no, they do? They do, don't they? I remember back in the late 80s, my first year of Bible college, uh, Edgar Wisnott sent out a little booklet to almost every church in America. Charles, do you remember this booklet? 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. I was attending Bonnie Slope Church of Christ, a little church of Christ, about 20 people, and my dad got a booklet from this guy about warning us about when the rapture is going to take place in 1988. 1988 came and went. No rapture. Of course, a lot of people got onto the bandwagon of the Y2K scare. 
Uh, even people previous to our generation made predictions about the year 2000. Edgar Cayce, Sun Young Moon, Jonathan Edwards all predicted that the year 2000 would be it. That's the end. And then as we got closer to the date, uh, authors wanted to cash in on the Y2K bug scare and that panic that everyone was going through. And so people like Jerry Falwell, Timothy LaHaye, and Ed Dobson all wrote about this Y2K being the beginning of the end. Y2K came and went. We're still here. Back in 1990, Pat Robertson wrote a book suggesting that 2007 would be it. That would be the end of the world. 2007 came and went. We're still here. You may remember Harold Camping. Uh, not too long ago, a preacher who, sent, who spent a lot of money trying to warn people about the Judgment Day, which would take place definitely on May 21st, 2011. And uh, he advertised on 55 different radio stations and put up over 2,000 billboards and sent his followers out with picket signs warning people about May 21st, 2011. May 21st, 2011 came and went. No Judgment Day. No rapture. In 2008, Ronald Wienlin declared himself and his wife, Laura, to be the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. And he predicted that the end of the world would take place in 2012. Ironically, he was found guilty of tax evasion in 2012. And get this, he was put in prison for 42 months. That's the exact amount of time that the two witnesses in Revelation are in sackcloth and ashes. I kind of wonder if the judge knew scripture and decided on that amount just as a little jab at him. But since his time in prison, he's made several more predictions about the end of the world, none of which, of course, have come true. One of the more recent prognosticators, false prophets, that you may hear about in the news is David Mead. We don't know his real name, that's his pen name. And uh, he's made several wild predictions about the end of the world. This guy's been on Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie, and he's been on the Glenn Beck radio program. He's written several books about these predictions. He predicted that a planet would crash into Earth in 2017, uh, ending our existence. Of course, that didn't happen. So he made another prediction that the rapture would play take place in 2018, and of course that didn't happen either, and uh, he's still out there making predictions, by the way. All these false prophets have failed in their predictions, and, and all of these false prophets have failed to keep the plain things the main things. They've been so obsessed with when these things are going to happen that they've completely overlooked the purpose of these prophecies, the why of God's word. The why is recorded for us in the plain principles in all these prophecies. Every prophecy, even the ones that don't apply specifically to our time, all these prophecies contain important principles that are practical and relevant for all Christians in every age. And so we need to look for those plain, simple principles within those prophecies and put those into practice. Look at what Jesus told his disciples in the first chapter of Acts. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit can, uh, comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The prophecies about the end of the age should motivate us to tell people about Christ. They should motivate us to, to spread the gospel. They're not there so we can try to crunch the numbers and figure out the numerology and, and figure out the exact date when it's going to take place. They're there to motivate us to be a witness for Christ. And look at what Moses says to the people of Israel near the end of his life. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, he says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. That's why we have these prophecies. And that's why they seem cryptic and hidden. Because 
The secret things belong to God. And these prophecies are to motivate us to follow his word and to trust him. Some prophecies in the Bible are hard to understand. And God has not given us an inspired interpretation of many of those prophecies. But that's okay. We can still trust God even if we don't know the end. Even if we don't know the inspired interpretation of a prophecy, we can still follow the plain things in his word. If we keep the plain things, the main things, we'll be able to follow all of God's word and pass it on to our children after us. How can we be ready for the end of the age? Well, we need to continue to prioritize God's word. In addition to all these false prophets out there and all these false messages out there, there's a lot of fake news going around that seems to be intentionally designed to cause fear and anxiety and worry. It's it's causing people to doubt what God has said and what God will do for us. But the Word of God, the Bible, is true. We can trust it. It is the only book that we can always trust to be true forever. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The Bible gives us the words of eternal life. The Bible tells us about the promises that God has given to us, that that he has provided for us. It tells us how to live in this world and get through all the trials and tribulations we face in this life. The Bible is an unchanging standard, a moral compass in a culture that is constantly shifting its values. And the Bible is the truth. Jesus said, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. When he was praying to his father in John 17. And in this world full of deception, the Bible is our only dependable fact checker. After the disciples asked Jesus about his predictions, the very first thing Jesus told them was to watch out for deception. In Mark 13, 5 through 6, Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. Satan is called the deceiver for a reason. He is the father of lies, and one of his main tools, one of his main weapons to attack our faith is deception. Later on in this chapter, Jesus gives us more details about these deceivers. He says in verses 21 through 23, At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. Some of these deceivers are going to have the ability to perform miraculous signs and wonders. Their presentation is going to be amazing and convincing, but their message is going to be false. And the only way we can know whether their message is true or false is if we know the Word of God. It it won't be by by what they can do. We, We can't look at, look at what he does. Look at what he's accomplished. That cannot be the test of whether their message is true. Whether their message is true has to be the Word of God. That is our only dependable fact checker, the Word of God. How can we be ready for the end of the age? We need to continue to preach the gospel. The end time prophecy should motivate us to share our faith and to lead people to Christ. I I showed you how Jesus, in in the book of Acts, in chapter 1, when the disciples were asking him about the timing of his predictions, he redirected their attention to the Great Commission and to leading people to Christ. And here in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus gives some really scary predictions about wars and earthquakes and famines and severe persecution. But then he says, through all of this, no matter what's happening, no matter how bad it is, you need to preach the gospel. This is what he says in in verses 9 and 10. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must be preached, must first be preached to all the nations. 
In Matthew's account, Jesus said, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Jesus said that things would get bad. Paul told Timothy that things will go from worse to worse. And this culture around us seems to be increasing in wickedness. And we can see how the love of many people is growing cold in, in a culture that is wicked and even hostile to Christianity. It's tempting to give up on sharing our faith. We're getting so much rejection. And it's, it's tempting to think that God's not taking care of us. And for some, it may even be tempting to give up on God. But don't give up. Jesus wants us to focus on our job and trust God with his job. Our job is to preach the gospel. If we trust God to take care of his job, then we can focus our attention on sharing our faith and leading people to Christ, even in those times of difficult trials. You see, there's a battle taking place. And Satan is trying to distract us from doing our job. He knows that he has already lost the war. And so he's doing whatever he can to cause as much damage as he can because he knows that his time is short. And so he'll use deception if he thinks that will work in getting us off sidetracked and, and off course and not doing our job. And he'll also use trials, difficulties in life, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, and yes, even pestilence and pandemics to try to get us off track, worried, anxious, fearful, and not doing what God wants us to do. But in all those trials, God is giving us opportunities to share the gospel. The gospel is the good news. And in times of worry and fear, people need good news. The gospel gives us hope that God has a solution for all these problems we face in this world. The gospel gives us a new life and a new purpose in life. The gospel empowers us to overcome sinful temptations and destructive habits. The gospel is the good news that Jesus died for our sins, giving us freedom and forgiveness of sins. And the gospel is the good news that Jesus rose from the dead, giving us the hope of eternal life, the hope of heaven. This was God's plan from the very beginning. In every book of the Bible, we can see the, the scarlet thread of the gospel, the plan of redemption from Genesis all the way to Revelation. When Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection, he said this, he told them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. God has entrusted to us this partnership with him to be witnesses of what Christ has done for us, to share our faith, to preach the gospel, to lead people to Christ. That's how we can prepare for the end. We also need to continue to practice our faith. In those difficult times when bad things are happening and it seems like the end of the world, don't give in to fear and don't give up on God. This is what Jesus says in verses 7 through 8. Jesus said, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. One of the main reasons that people fall away from the faith or, or never even accept the gospel is because they look at all the suffering in the world. And they think, how? How could a good God, an all-good God, and an all-powerful God allow all this suffering in the world? And that is another deception of Satan. You see, they're suffering in the world because of sin, because of our own free will. God created us with the free will to choose 
to either accept him or reject him, to choose to either obey the two greatest commandments or to disobey them. God wants us to choose to love him and to love one another. But because we have free will, uh, all people have chosen at some point to sin, and that sin has consequences. It, it causes all of creation to suffer. But God has a solution. The gospel is a solution to all the problems we see in the creation around us. The gospel is God's plan to redeem and to renew and to restore his creation. No matter how bad it gets, we must always continue to believe in the gospel. And we must continue to live out our faith, to practice our faith, loving God and loving one another. Even those people who persecute us. In Mark 13, 12 through 13, Jesus said, <clears throat> Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. No matter how bad it gets, don't ever give up on Jesus. Jesus ends this discourse with a parable illustrating the fact that we do not know when the end will be. And since we don't know the last day, we must be ready every day. That's one of the reasons why we don't know the last day. <laughs> to, to motivate us to be ready every day. This is what Jesus says in the last part of this chapter. He says, be on your guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and he tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch, watch. He's saying, be ready. <clears throat> be ready every day as if it's the last day. We can't know when Christ will return. <clears throat> but we need to be living our lives every day as if it could be today. And in reality, it could be today. It could be today that Jesus returns to us. Or it could be today that any one of us returns to him. You see, there are two ends that we need to consider. There is the end of the age. There's also the end of our life. And Jesus could at any moment call any one of us home. We don't know when the end will be. So we must be ready, always. Are you ready for the end? If you're not a Christian, do not put this off. Do not think that, oh, I got plenty of time. Because you have no idea how much time you have. If you're not a Christian, today you can know for certain that you're ready. Put your faith in Christ. Turn away from your sin and be baptized into Christ. And you can know for certain that, yes, I am ready for the end. Whether it's the end of my life or the end of the age, I want to be ready. At this time, I'd like to have the praise team come and prepare to lead us in a closing song. And as they do that, let's think about the end. Let's consider the end. And these principles here in Mark 13, are we ready for the end? Are we keeping the plain things, the main things? Are we continuing to prioritize God's word? Are we continuing to preach the gospel? And are we continuing to practice our faith? Let's stand. We're going to have a word of prayer. And uh, after we pray, we'll sing one more song. And then we'll be dismissed. I want to encourage you to stick around for a time of refreshments and fellowship in the entryway of the church there. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have given us the message of the gospel, a message of hope, a good news message. And God, that you have provided a way for us to be forgiven of our sins and freed from our sins and the hope of eternal life, a relationship with you forever in heaven. And God, we know that there are many things that we don't understand, prophecies that are hard to interpret and seem to be uh, complicated and confusing. And God, if those things are hidden for, from us for a reason, God, help us to just trust you. And God, if you want us to understand, help us to interpret them accurately. But God, most of all, we just pray that you'd help us to keep the main things, uh, the plain things, the main things. Help us to put into practice those practical principles of Scripture and to live for you every day. God, help us to be ready for the Pray this in the name of your son, Jesus.